Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Zoo Fits book project. Uh, currently, the work in progress is ca calling these Animal Notes, but I am open for some suggestions. If you have uh, books you'd like to recommend or a name for the project, you can call Keeper Records, Training Notes, Reviews for Zoos, uh, whatever conveys the sharing of ideas to improve not just animal care professional lives, but everyone, so we can show up as the best versions of ourselves for the animals, the community and the world. Uh, today we're going to be discussing Lads Before the Wind by Karen Pryor. And Karen is the founder of the Karen Pryor Clicker Training, which is the, considered the leader in positive reinforcement training methodology. She is the author of dozens of books, including the bestseller, international bestseller, Don't Shoot the Dog, which is considered by many to be the animal trainer's bible, and rightly so. Alas Before the Wind chronicles her eight years from 1963 to 1971 working with dolphins, which they called porpoises back then, at Hawaii's Sea Life Park. Karen has established some of the most innovative training techniques, which are now considered standard practices in today's training world. Now, I chose Alas Before the Wind as my first note on Pryor's books because well, it just re I had just received it in the mail, and it had been on my wish list for ages, and I just I couldn't wait to read it and share it with you. So I think this was her first book written as, as an animal trainer, just a few years after she left Sea Life Park. Uh, the book is technically considered ancient by modern science standards since it was published in 1975, but the principles Karen learned and developed are now considered standard practices among many trainers. And I'm really glad I dove in with this book because it has so many gems. I can't wait to share some of the eye-opening big ideas that I had. You can see all the notes that I took um, from this book, big ideas I received. So I'm going to get started with uh, kicking off with a couple of quotes straight from the book. Following the rules of shaping, you can get virtually any animal to do anything it is physically and mentally capable of doing. Turtles, lobsters, minnows, anything can be trained. All you need to do is figure out how to break down the behavior you have in mind into small enough steps so that you can train one step at a time. It is astonishing how easily we ourselves tend to develop habits. Now, even though this book features principles probably well, well known to most animal professionals, I still felt this, that the idea I'd be sharing, or the ideas I'd be sharing, would pertain to trainers, zookeepers and, and the like. But as I delved further and further into this fantastic memoir, I, I became more and more convinced that this wisdom Karen shares so long ago is very pertinent to nearly everyone today. And a lot of my ideas from ZooFit stem from principles originally developed by Karen and early pioneers of positive reinforcement training. And this book didn't just cement these ideas, it actually brought some new ones to life. So some of the big ideas I'm going to be discussing today are the excitement of learning and figuring things out, go back to kindergarten, putting the undesired behavior on schedule or on cue, when the show is too good, i.e. we are never exonerated, and number five, how smart are dolphins, the fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So kicking it off, uh, here, here are the rules. This is from Karen Pryor. Here are the rules, the scientific laws underlying training. It was written in thick prose and stiff scientific jargon. I could see why other trainers had been unwilling to digest it. It was exciting though. Now this is part of excitement of learning and figuring things out. Karen's whole book is about how she developed different training techniques Apart from this manual written by Ron Turner, a psychologist who worked on establishing training criteria, and apart from just trial and error. But the one thing she keeps saying throughout each new challenge and learning situation is that learning is fun. She, was, she thrived on it. And when Karen was working on training Sea Life Park's animals, many of the principles that we animal professionals use every day hadn't been developed yet. In fact, it was Karen who developed most of these very innovative practices. But this didn't overwhelm her. This whole new world was exciting to her. And sometimes I feel that uh, animal trainers today might be a little bit on the spoiled side. We have all of this knowledge from pioneers already at our fingertips. 
Sometimes we're even fortunate enough to receive personal guidance from modern experts like Steve Martin, Susan Friedman, or Ken Ramirez. But imagine having to figure out all these principles for yourself. Imagine what it would be like to have this dolphin in front of you and not knowing how to overcome a particular challenge or obstacle. I mean, you couldn't call in an expert to show you how to handle this because there weren't any at this point. You just figured it out yourself. But even more than just figuring out yourself, imagine instead of seeing this process as extremely difficult or exhausting, you loved and you cherished every moment. You found it exciting and exhilarating. And Karen wasn't the only one excited from learning. It seems, it, it seems to her, from her book, that the dolphins seem to respond to the learning process as well with excitement and with eagerness. A Karen recounts how she was training her animals to create novel behaviors, actions that they had not been trained before. Now, after only moments of frustration from not receiving a re reinforcement or a reward for doing spectacular behaviors, the dolphins became quite inventive and caught on to Karen's agenda pretty quickly. As she says, Malia seemed to have learned the criteria. She was deliberately coming up with something new. Sometimes she was very excited to see us in the morning. Ingrid and I had the unscientific feeling that she sat all night thinking up stuff and rushed into the first show with an air of, wait till you see this one. So not only do the trainers look at the learning opportunities as exciting, but the animals find challenges exciting too. And to me, that's a fantastic approach to learning. It is exciting and part of this whole adventure that we're on. It also reminds me of Marie Forleo's uh, book, Everything is Figure Outable. With, I'll have a link uh, to that uh, in the description for that gem for if you want to check that out. And many times while reading this book, I would boldly like, interrupt my husband who was sitting next to me and went, Hey, you got to listen to this. This is amazing. Because Karen didn't just get her trainers and dolphins excited about sciencey stuff and learning. She helped me change my attitude about learning and figuring things out with a positive attitude as well. So how do you view learning and challenges? Do you find it excruciating, wishing somebody would just wave their magic wand and make it stick? Or do you thrive on that challenge? Now, big idea number two, go back to kindergarten. I quote, the two wheels plunged in opposite directions, turned, leaped, and one from the left the other from the right, over the rope, and had a 3,000 pound, 20 mile an hour, head-on collision in midair. Of course, they refused to jump again. No ma'am, not me. We had to revamp the shaping plan completely." End quote. Now Karen is describing a training process of two false killer whales learning to do a double jump. Now rather than doing this side-by-side -side leap out of the water, Karen wanted the two to cross going in opposite directions. And so the training, as she described, was going great with each whale jumping the correct direction over the rope. And the trainers felt the whales were ready to try to jump together. But then that happened, head on collision. The way that Karen and her colleague Jenny reworked this behavior was very inventive. It became a standard practice for when animals regress and things that I've actually even have done in my time as a trainer too. It can be times when dealing with entirely new situations or regression or plateaus and the trainers would incorporate what they call going back to kindergarten. Now this criteria of perfection would lax considerably and the trainers would go back a few steps to where we were seeing success to rework that behavior. So instead of going back to the very beginning of training the whales to go right over a rope at the bottom of the pool, Karen and Jenny trained the whales to do the jump just on opposite sides of the rope. So one was jumping on one end and the other one was jumping on the far other end, far away from each other. And then they let the rope sag in the middle. Now the natural tendency for an animal to do the least amount of work for the highest amount of reward led these whales to go from the ends to gradually gravitate towards the middle of the rope. And when they came together, and when they came closer together, they started gauging each other's approach and kept to their own sides as they jumped. And then the end result was the trainers had what they were aiming for, a beautiful double bow from two exotic beautiful whales. As Karen reminisced, it remains, I think, one of the most stunning behaviors we've ever developed. 
Now, again, the trainers didn't go all the way back to the beginning stages of the training, and that would be in what I would consider rebirth, not going back to kindergarten. The whales were successfully jumping over the rope. It was jumping together that they were now unsure of. So Jenny and Karen went back to the baseline where the whales were successful and then moved forward in a different path. And this concept reminds me of Brian Johnson of Optimize, which is a way to improve your life with ancient wisdom and modern science, and his stance on taking your prior best, or making your prior best your new baseline. Now, as we incrementally get better and better, we're going to falter along the way. It's going to happen. But as we continue on this trajectory, we don't have to again start all over again from scratch. No, we're, we're, if we're up here and we need to falter, we just go back to the last level of where we were achieving success. It's your new baseline. So are there any habits or goals that you're working on that have you stuck? Are you feeling that you're headed for a 3,000 pound, 20 mile per hour collision in midair? Just go back a few steps, go back to kindergarten and continue your trajectory, spiraling up towards achieving our dreams. And our next big idea, putting undesired behaviors on cue. Quote, once Makua was down there, there was not much I could do. Timeouts had no effect. Indeed, by sinking, he was giving me a timeout. There was no way to punish him. How do you get rid of a behavior that you don't want? End quote. Oh, I relate to Makua. Makua was doing everything in his power to avoid his training session, much to the increasing frustration of the trainer. Whenever he was done with this training session, Makua would just simply drop down to the bottom of the pool and hang out. I mean, this guy is the king of procrastination. And if he's the king, then I'm the queen. Because lately I've developed an annoying habit of scrolling around social media, YouTube, and doing anything except my creative work I ultimately want to get done. But social media is so reinforcing and sometimes my creative work is so, well, not as reinforcing. So how do you get rid of procrastination? Well, as Karen discovered, you can put it on cue. In her words, the word extinction cropped up a lot in the business of bringing a behavior under stimulus control. When a behavior is occurring on cue is extinguishing off cue, and there was the answer. I would train Makua to lie on the bottom on purpose to a particular sound. Then I would extinguish the behavior off cue. Then when I didn't want him to play possum, I wouldn't give him the cue. So the next time Makua sank himself, I blew the whistle and threw him a handful of fish. He admitted his large, astonished bubble and surfaced and ate the fish. We went back to blindfold work. By and by, he sank himself again, and I reinforced it again. But the next day, he was sinking over and over, and I began requiring a certain length of sinking time, and even going as far as giving him a timeout if he came up too soon. Soon, I had the sinking behavior stretched to a reliable 30 seconds, and I introduced the sound cue, which Makua learned rapidly. Now, this behavior was so great that Karen incorporated the sinking, it, the sinking behavior into the program that they presented at Sea Life Park. And that is the key. The key to making this work isn't to never ask for the behavior again, but to ask for it when it's appropriate. So basically, I started scheduling my unproductive procrastination time. I put the behavior on cue. I reward my productive efforts of writing, creating videos, or completing modules or lessons in my coach class with 10, 15, or even 20 minutes of watching YouTube videos, going down rabbit holes on Twitter, or spacing out on zoo posts on Facebook. Now, if I'm feeling antsy about a bunch of projects, instead of getting overwhelmed, I honestly just put my computer aside and play my Find It game on my phone for about 5 or 10 minutes. This, this idea is kind of like getting it out of my system, de detaching from stress, and then figure out what's important now and then focus on that. And guys, let me tell you, it works. And I don't have high statistics, but this is amazing principle for dealing with unruly behavior, and it really works. I've been more productive and more focused on my big three, energy, work, and love, than ever before. And I don't feel bad about procrastination because I just schedule it. So can you schedule your undesired behavior? 
Put it on a cue, and when you don't want your bad habit to rear its ugly head, simply don't ask for it until you're ready. Our next big idea, when the show is too good. <laughs> Quote, we decided the show at the Ocean Science Theater was getting a little too good, a little too polished. The animals knew the routine perfectly. The narrators, myself included, were slipping into a rote narration. There were no mistakes. Consequently, there were none of those interesting moments when no one, including the trainer, knew what would happen next. Now, Karen talks about this aspect of her work in a chapter called The Creative Porpoise. And this decision that the show was too good led to some amazing, and I mean, innovative, groundbreaking research into dolphin cognitive studies. And just for the show itself, Karen and her colleagues started training a novel behavior to the dolphins so the audience could see the training process. But in order to do that accurately, they couldn't just, pre they couldn't use any previously trained behaviors. The dolphin had to come up with something on their own. So when one thing led to another and soon, Karen and her team were studying originality and innovation with dolphins, which was unheard of concepts for areas of research in those days. And it all started because their show was getting a little too good. Now, this is an important thing to remember. When things in our own life, our own show, are getting a little too good, aka easy or boring, that's a huge indicator that we need to change things up as well. Once again, Brian Johnson from Optimize says, we will never be exonerated from doing the work. We are always going to be working towards perfection, but we will never get there. Now, Karen is basically saying the same thing, only she's adding, why would you want to be exonerated? Exoneration and perfection is boring. It's nothing that the audience wants to see. So we're always going to be upping our game, learning new behaviors, experimenting with what works and what doesn't work, and we consider this good. This is progress. Just like the dolphin show, we are never exonerated. We have to keep going, keep getting better. Because when it's too good, we aren't challenging ourselves. When we shake things up, progress and shift, we make amazing discoveries that change our lives and make our lives and the world just a little bit better. Now, last, our final big idea, how smart are dolphins? The fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. Quote, it began to seem to me that intelligence is made up of a lot of different things. The ability to solve problems, the ability to learn and retain, the ability to observe. There are individuals in a species that star in one or another aspect of intelligence. So how smart is a porpoise? I think somehow it's the wrong question. Well, Karen calls this kind of questioning of animals intelligence linear thinking and I completely agree. There is no one line, there's no line that maps dumb animals at the bottom and smart animals at the top. It's going to be very multidimensional. And as Albert Einstein once said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. And this is similar to what motivation researcher Carol Dweck calls a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. How smart is this animal compared to that animal? Situates them in this linear fashion, and we do it to ourselves and everyone else very, very frequently. As Carol states in her book, Mindset, believing your qualities are carved in stone, the fixed mindset creates this urgency to prove yourself over and over. If you only have a certain amount of intelligence, certain personality, then you better prove that you have it, a healthy dose of it. In a growth mindset, the hand that you're dealt with is just the starting point for development. It's based on the belief that your basic qualities are things that you can cultivate through your efforts. And although people may have different, may differ in every, every which way, their initial talents and aptitudes, interests, or temperaments, everyone can change and grow through application and experience. So I feel when we place this question of proof how, of how smart animals are, we are projecting a fixed mindset upon that species. And it's not a question that can be easily answered. Dolphins use tools, they think ahead, they problem solve, oh, they're smart. Yeah, but so do crows and yeah, they're smart too. So do squirrels. So it's, really, it's a hard measure to, to, to put a linear thinking, a fixed mindset on animals' intelligence. 
But when we think this linearly about animals, it's just as easy to think this way about ourselves. Animal intelligence is similar to human abilities. It's not what we're born with, it's our mindset. And as Carol writes, is it ability or is it mindset? Was it Mozart's musical ability or the fact that he worked till his hands were deformed? Was it Darwin's scientific ability or the fact that he collected specimen nonstop from an early childhood? So, how smart are dolphins? That's the wrong question. Let's move from a fixed to a growth mindset and accept and adapt to new challenges before us. Well, that's what I've got from this fascinating memoir from Karen Pryor. If you're interested in more great insights from one of the pioneers in positive reinforcement training, again, I highly, highly recommend it. There's a link to buy it in the description, uh, description of this video. I'm going to close up with this a few quotes from the book. These are all from Karen Pryor in, in Lads Before the Wind. She says, designing a porpoise show is one of those tasks in which naivete is probably an advantage. If you don't really know what has been done before, you're not tempted to copy. If you don't know what can be done, you're not limited by the ideas of what can't be done. And I think this is great wisdom for all life. If we don't know what others have accomplished, we won't be tempted to place limits on our potential. She also says, the path to a desired endpoint can take any direction. There are probably as many ways to shape a given behavior as there are trainers to train it. Again, this is a great, great wisdom. There are no wrong ways to learn, folks. There's no, there is no one the way. Your path is going to be unique. And finally, she says, that simple rule, when things went wrong, to look at what you were actually reinforcing has bailed me out of a lot of problems. And it gives me a kind of pause. So are you struggling with behavior of yours or even a behavior of someone else? Are you inadvertently reinforcing or rewarding it? Change that game and change your life. Lads Before the Wind, Diary of a Dolphin Trainer. What big idea did you love? Share with me, share the book, and share our knowledge so we can take care of the world by taking better care of yourself. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.